grew up on piano. Like my parents had a baby grand. But pretty quickly, I wanted a different keyboard that was more with the times. And so I got a Farfisa, which I played for a long time. And when I first sat in with Tom and Mike in Mud Crutch, that's what I played. I got a Wurlitzer, probably in 71. And I got a Marshall 100 watt stack. And I think I only ever used the stack once or twice because it was just too much. And that's what I played in Mud Crutch at the beginning. Because through the Marshall, the Wurlitzer sounded like a rhythm guitar, or it could. Ryan Adams a few years ago, and it, it was just called Ryan Adams, of all things. We did it at his studio, Pax Am, which is a great studio, and there wasn't room for a Hammond. So I brought my Vox Continental, and I brought a little battery-powered Casio, and, and Ryan said, try this, the Casio and the Vox Continental through uh, Leslie and through a um, memory man that Ryan said, try this. And then he gave me the memory man. And I'd been using his electric mistress on the track at the same time. So I just started getting a, a few effects like that. Before that, I'd used um, fuzz pedals. I've got a Hammond that I had for 10 years or more before I knew that it had an effects loop. And I did a record for the Cult. And my Hammond has a solid state Leslie that I use a lot of the time. And it's very clean. And they said, it sounds great. Can you get it dirty? And I said, well, this is all it does. And they said, well, you have an effects loop. And I'm like, you're kidding. And they said, and we have a fuzz pedal. And I said, oh, really? And they threw the fuzz pedal on. And it sounded like, not like John Lord, because nothing does, but it had that deep purple thing going on. And I was off to the races. But I never want it to be overtaken by the effects and Campbell's the same way, because Campbell, he'll use effects and he uses them really well. But you give Mike a guitar, and he's a genius with tone, and he knows all the amps and all the guitar combinations. All the guitars that we use up there aren't for show. But if you just give Campbell a guitar and he plays, he sounds like Mike. You know, the sound's in the player. And I never want these to get in the way of it, but damn, they're really fun, and sometimes they just throw something onto whatever you're doing that that lets you sing more. Synthesizers I have never liked. I hear people do great things with them and I can't make them do that. And Michael sit down at a synthesizer and write, you got lucky, I'll sit down at a synthesizer and it's, it's, you got ugly, it's just not good. <laughs> I don't understand synthesizers. And I don't have a lot of fun or patience going, here's how I get a sound. There's so much you can do with the piano that I haven't, I haven't even scratched the surface. There's so much you can do with draw bars that I haven't even scratched the surface. And once you get into these things, and I know that, you know, Brian Eno, Patrick Leonard, all these cats, they all know how and get a pleasure from sculpting sounds and going, oh, you can do this. And I look into it and, I'm, and my brain freezes. I'm just, it does not intrigue me at all. But if you listen to Booker, you listen to Matthew Fisher on Wider Shade of Pale, you listen to that kind of stuff, then you've got, there's timelessness to a Hammond. There's a timelessness to a Wurlitzer, and they were all novelties at some point, but they've lasted. And generally, a synth sound will define a decade or will be defined by a decade. You look at that English thing that came along that had this certain kind of sound, or the, you know, do you think I'm sexy kind of thing. It's all, it's all like locked into an era and it evokes an era. And to me, 
I don't really like clever. I like smart, but I don't like clever and I don't like gimmicky because it sounds like it comes from the head, not the heart.